Okay, we've just discussed humanism. Now let's move on to classicism, the art of humanism. Now keep in mind that this is not an art class, but it is a class about Europe. And we are going to look at how humanism influenced European art at the time of the Renaissance. So keep in mind the connection between the values of humanism and the products of Renaissance art, of classical art, are going to be emphasized on this exam. Uh, we've seen FRQs about that, we've seen questions. So keep in mind not only the works of art, but how humanism has contributed to them. Okay, got that. Uh, art in the Middle Ages. Now if we look here, we see two-dimensional and what kind of coloring? Uh, and then religious subjects, okay? So you see uh, a sample from Western Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, you know, that really you're not, uh, you're not seeing anything outside of religion. You're not seeing any attempt to represent things in 3D, any kind of perspective. Really kind of boring by our standards. We've seen much more interesting art uh, in our time. And so let's look at characteristics of classical art. Now keep in mind, I always show you Raphael's The School of Athens as the prototype here. When you're thinking about classical art, always call this to mind as the work of Renaissance art that perfectly captures all of these aspects of classicism. The first being bright, vivid colors uh, that we see here that, uh, you know, in contrast to those uh, other works of art that we looked at, this reaches out and gets you. Everything here is bright. It screams at you. So we see perspective, uh, depth, realism. It's uh, an attempt to portray this as if you are looking at it. Third, balance. Uh, if you look here, everything's balanced. If you see something on one side, there's something on the other side. And the fourth, classical themes. We see that Greek, Roman, and biblical themes predominate uh, in classical art. So here, you see the bright colors. You see the perspective. You can see the 3D look to it. You see the balance that Plato and Aristotle are at the center. Speaking of classical figures, okay? So Plato and Aristotle at the center, everything branching out. Uh, we can see Socrates there corrupting the youth. We see Diogenes sitting on the steps. We see a lack of Christian figures in this painting. So you see the secularism of the Renaissance. Uh, and then you see uh, here that that woman is Hypatia, who was actually torn apart by Christians in Egypt in the early Christian era. Is this a rejection of Christianity? No, but it is a statement of the value of the classical tradition and how the Christian tradition is not in any way superior to all of this, that this is the epitome of humanity. So again, vivid bright colors, perspective, balance, and classical themes. If you keep those four things in mind, then you will be able to discuss things intelligently on your AP European History exam. And the masters of the Italian Renaissance. Uh, you know, you've seen uh, your turtles, uh, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Donatello. Uh, you'll see them as well as a few other artists uh, in this slideshow. So there is Donatello's St. Mark. Um, this is one of the earlier ones. Keep in mind that the High Renaissance peaks around the year 1500. So this is very early in the Renaissance. So here is a biblical figure um, who is standing uh, contra pasta. Okay, if we look here, this, uh, this whole uh, standing on one foot, uh, you know, one, one leg is straight, the other leg is, uh, you know, going to the side. The weight is on one leg. Uh, when somebody has a contrapasta stance. And here is St. George, once again. Now, this is an early Christian uh, figure um, who is standing again, contrapasta. Donatello's David. Now, notice here, whoa, he's naked. Yes, he's naked. Uh, this is something that was prevalent in Greco-Roman art, not prevalent in Christian art in the Middle Ages at all, bless you. Uh, but Donatello here sculpts David um, in the nude. And this is the first freestanding nude sculpture of the Renaissance.
And so uh, since the classical period, the Romans did this sort of thing all the time, but you've had a thousand years go by where nobody in Europe is sculpting naked people standing uh, by themselves. Uh, of course, this guy's got company. He's got Goliath's head that he's standing on. And we see here um, an early uh, Renaissance uh, painting uh, known as the, the Tribute Money, which you see here, three different uh, little things here. It's the whole story about uh, the biblical story of the tax collector from the temple coming to Jesus and saying, it's time to pay your temple tax. And Jesus is like, well, don't have any money. Um, so he tells St. Peter, he says, St. Peter, could you go over there? There's going to be a fish and just open up the fish's mouth and uh, look inside and you'll see a coin. Bring me that coin and we'll pay our temple tax. In fact, it'll be enough for me and for you. And so St. Peter does that and uh, then gets it to uh, the guy in the overly short uh, tunic. Um, but now what you see here is this, uh, this perspective, uh, you know, chiaroscuro shading, where we see that at the center you see uh, the Lord and the, uh, the tax collector in his short skirt uh, and the disciples. Now, of course, you also see halos. They're, uh, they're still being uh, respectful. But uh, you see the vivid, bright colors. You see the balance uh, here as well. But the use of lighting to bring attention to certain parts of the painting and put something uh, as your focus. And so there is the Mona Lisa, which uh, is one of da Vinci's works. Uh, I'm not nearly as impressed with it as other people have been, but at the same time, you see behind Mona Lisa that scenery. You see the perspective there. Uh, looks like a little road that you could go down to on your way to a uh, lake or something of that nature. And the Last Supper, which of course uh, has launched all kinds of conspiracy theories and that sort of thing. Now, of course, the Last Supper, this was an experiment of da Vinci's, and uh, the painting has been very hard to preserve. This is what it might have looked like. This is one of da Vinci's students uh, who was copying it, and that one's turned out a little better. But once again, balance. You see at the center uh, the Lord with his disciples. You see six on one side, six on the other. You see a biblical theme. Uh, you, of course, see the perspective that uh, the room is clearly in 3D. Uh, Leonardo's uh, Vertuvian Man. Now, this is from his sketchbook, but of course, humanism here. Uh, wanting to sketch the human body uh, is what da Vinci's doing here. Michelangelo's Pieta. Now, here you've got uh, the classic uh, you know, picture of the mother of God holding her son uh, after his crucifixion. Keep in mind that she's uh, larger than he is because she is the focus here. Um, he's not the focus. Uh, she is. And her grief um, holding her son as he's pulled down from the cross. Now, of course, individualism uh, we see uh, coming through here a bit. If you look here, uh, Michelangelo, uh, you know, the story says that uh, he heard somebody looking at it and asking, who did that? Now, keep in mind that the Renaissance is the beginning of the elevation of the artist. The artist used to be an artisan. That's where we, we get the same word for both, uh, that this person would be about the same as a stonemason or somebody like that. Uh, but now we see the glorification of the artist, Michael Angelus Bonatoris Florent Facchiebat. Michelangelo, a Florentine, did this. This is my work. Went in there after hours and sketched that on the mother of God's chest. Later on, he regretted that. He thought maybe that was a little egotistical. He never signed one of his artworks again. But you can see the enormous ego of the artist uh, that uh, these medieval artists, we don't know who they are, but we know who these people are because we know what they did. We know that they were proud of their work and that their work gave them a good place in society, a very exalted place in society, that artistic talent is something that's valued during the Renaissance. And so there, Michelangelo's David, as I said, the epitome of humanism. Uh, as you can see here, uh, when you read the biblical text, you could read a miracle into uh, little teenage David uh, slaying Goliath with some stones, but uh, this guy doesn't need a miracle. This guy is the epitome of humanity, and he is ready to kill. He is ready to do anything that he wants. He is ready to be what he wills to be, as Pico uh, would have said in the Oration on the Dignity of Man. 
And so once again, the contrapposta stance uh, where you see him putting his weight on one of his legs, one of his hips, and he is ready to strike. Uh, the Renaissance here is in full maturity. This is uh, in the midst of the high Renaissance. There is Michelangelo's Moses. Uh, which, uh, you know, of course, uh, Moses portrayed with horns here because of a mistranslation in the Latin Bible. Uh, this was uh, at a papal tomb, uh, the tomb of Julius II. Now, keep in mind that the Medici were big patrons of the art, so was the Catholic Church. And so here is the Sistine Chapel in Rome, in Vatican City, which uh, hopefully uh, some of us will get to see when we go to uh, Europe next spring. Michelangelo was one of many artists who painted the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo uh, specifically painted the ceiling and also the backdrop where you can see the Last Judgment. The most famous painting um, in the Sistine Chapel is the painting of the creation of Adam. And there is, uh, you know, is God uh, having breathed life into Adam. And if you note here, uh, you see that their fingers are not quite touching. But whose decision is this, that their fingers are not touching each other? It is Adam's decision. And so really, what keeps Adam from elevating himself? Only his own decision. And you can see here that, uh, you know, this man is held back only by himself. He can be whatever it is that he wills himself to be. Michelangelo's Last Judgment, which, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on art, but I've been told it includes some of his enemies going down there into hell. And uh, also, I can't really point out from here, but there's somewhere where he's uh, portrayed on here as well. Uh, a lot of times artists would place themselves into their work at this time. And the Michelangelo here is a very exhausted uh, Michelangelo. It's kind of like playing Where's Waldo here with all of these figures. Uh, I'll let you pause the video and find it if you really want to look for it that bad. And another painting from the Sistine Chapel, The Delivery of the Keys. Of course, keep in mind that the Pope is uh, the one who's commissioning these works of art. So, uh, hey, how about that bit where Jesus gets the keys to Peter? And remember, Popes are all successors of Peter. And so Jesus is giving the keys to the kingdom to St. Peter and saying, Upon this rock I'll build my church. What you shall bind on earth, I shall bind in heaven. What you shall bind... What you shall loose on earth, I shall loose in heaven. And that goes for all of your successors, too, including the current pope, who is my vicar. And keep in mind in the back here, you see the perspective here. Um, and you can also see this Renaissance architecture in the back, uh, where you see uh, balance here again. You see a Roman triumphal arch. You see domes. You see this imitation of Greco-Roman architecture. Uh, one of Michael Angelo's last paintings of the conversion of Saul. Um, this is moving a little beyond the Renaissance, not quite as balanced, a little more chaotic here, but one of my favorites. The School of Athens, okay? Remember, this is the, uh, the epitome of Renaissance classical art. And, of course, while the Renaissance was very, uh, you know, focused on men, okay, uh, that, uh, you know, it's focused on men, but uh, there were some artists, such as Raphael, who painted women, okay? So Raphael, known for his, uh, for his paintings of females. Of course, Raphael, uh, very, very uh, interested in women. There was one time one of his, uh, one of his patrons uh, had to bring a woman in because he couldn't stop thinking about this woman uh, and couldn't get his work done. Uh, and so he said, okay, I'll bring her over there to live with you so you can get your painting done. Um, here is uh, La Fornarnina, which uh, the baker's daughter, um, who is uh, this woman, uh, allegedly one of his many mistresses. Uh, same woman here, um, La Velata, which i um, not remembering what that means right now, having one of those, uh, those Rick Perry moments. But, uh, you know, there is another woman there. And, of course, uh, this one here, uh, the young woman with a unicorn. Um, and uh, remember, we said that was painted over at some point. Somebody put a dog there because I guess a unicorn is a symbol of magic or something like that. But uh, just holding her baby uh, unicorn. Uh, pretty cool stuff. And Renaissance architecture. St. Peter's Basilica, um, a Renaissance uh, Renaissance uh, building. As you can see here, the balance. Okay, there's one column there, and then you see another column. Uh, or I mean another dome. You see a dome on each side. 
you see statues up there. You see a big dome in the middle. And of course, you see columns. Uh, you see, uh, you know, every, if you look from the center, one side of the building looks just like the other. So in imitation of Greco-Roman architecture. Symmetry, proportion, domes, columns. Those are the things that you're looking at here, that everything's symmetrical, proportional. When you see domes and columns, you know that this is Renaissance architecture. Now, here is uh, here's somebody's villa. And notice that uh, when you look at this side of the villa and this side of the villa, it's exactly the same. There's a floor plan there in the corner, and you can see that all four sides of this villa look exactly like the others. Uh, you know, so this is taking uh, you know, the symmetry uh, thing to the point of uh, obsession. And in just a second, we will talk about the northern renaissance in the new modern